Book 4, Chapter 13, The Lord of Life Jesus returned from the mountain and entered Capernaum, surrounded by apostles whose minds must have been much occupied by the things which they had heard. The multitudes had listened to him, accepting him as a scribe, marvelled that he spoke with authority. Immediately it was known that he was back in the city, he was once more the centre of importunate crowds pressing their needs upon him. Quartered at Capernaum at that time was a remarkable Roman officer. He was a centurion in charge of foreign troops in the town. But unlike the great majority of Romans, he had come to respect to the Jews, their God, and their laws. Although it is evident that he had not gone so far as to become a proselyte, he had built the Jews a synagogue. But the centurion had a greater commendation. He possessed unbounded faith in Jesus. He showed a care for his slave which was almost unique in a man of his standing. There was a humility about him which came strangely from a responsible Roman. There can be no doubt that he knew a great deal about Jesus. His behaviour suggests acquaintance with the noblemen of Herod's court who had had it to Cana a few weeks before when his son was at the point of death. He had probably heard how Jesus had spoken of the word which had restored his son twenty-five miles away. Thus it was that when he heard that Jesus was back in the city, the centurion sought aid on behalf of his sick servant. In his humility he would not go to Jesus himself, but asked the rulers of the Jews to make the appeal on his behalf. It may be that some members of the deputation acceded to the request reluctantly, but their indebtedness to their benefactor prevented refusal. Their approach did not reflect the humility which the centurion would have desired. Instead of laying stress upon the Romans' need and faith, they emphasised his worthiness and his generosity. They besought him instantly that he was worthy for whom he should do this, for he loveth our nation, and hath built us a synagogue. But Jesus recognised the faith and the humility behind the request. As he recognised the quality of a centurion who would concern himself so deeply over the health of a slave, he went with them towards the Romans' residence. Before the company could arrive, the centurion once more intervened. He sent out his friends to Jesus with the message that it was not fit that Jesus should defile himself by entering his home, nor did he consider himself worthy to come out and speak with him. He expressed his belief that all that would be necessary for the healing of his servant could be accomplished by a word. He went on to give the grounds for his faith, interpreting the power of Jesus in terms of his authority as a soldier. He believed Jesus, under the authority of God, could command sickness by a word, just as he himself could command his servants in the name of Caesar. There are only two instances in the Gospels where it is recorded that Jesus marvelled. He marvelled at the unbelief of his fellow townspeople at Nazareth. He marvelled at the belief of this Roman soldier. Jesus faced the deputation of the Jews. Consciousness of their divine favour contrasted strangely with the humility of this Gentile. Their unbelief presented an even more forceful enigma in the light of his profound and reasoned faith. They were of all people, the children of faith. They were the natural offspring of faithful Abraham. God had sent his Son into their midst, seeking a faithful response to his words of life, words which had been given the testimony of miraculous works. 
But that response was not to be found in Israel. It was found at this moment in the heart of a Roman centurion. Jesus turned to the men who, in introducing the needs of the heathen, had so smugly referred to our nation. He assumed the role of a prophet. I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. These words were the confirmation of the promise of God to Abraham and of the testimony of the prophets. Yet there can be no doubt that the rulers of the synagogue could have received no ruder shock to their cherished beliefs than they did outside the centurion's house that day. They had unwittingly set the scene for a demonstration which was a complete inversion of a hitherto unquestioned picture. They had a very clear conception of their favoured position, not only now, but in the end of the world that they should forfeit their ancient and natural prerogative was unthinkable, that they should be cast into outer darkness in anger and sorrow, whilst heathens from all over the earth enjoyed the privilege they had lost, was altogether beyond their comprehension. But that Jesus had present and undeniable evidence of a faith that put their unbelief to shame, they could not deny. His pronouncement would do nothing to heal the breach that had already appeared in his relations with them. Although they had no answer now, it would not be long before they showed their hand. Meanwhile the word of power had gone forth. The centurion's servant had been restored according to his faith. In spite of superficial appearances in Matthew's account, it is conclusive that the soldier had no personal contact with Jesus, with that wonderful reverence for human personality which shines forth in so many of his contacts. The Lord respected the man's sincere humility, showing him by his absence how truly he had understood his heavenly mission. He paid silent tribute to his robust faith. These were busy days in Capernaum. Jesus had little time to do anything but attend to the ceaseless needs of the multitudes. So great was his concentration upon this ministry, and so much did he neglect himself, that several of his friends sought forcibly to restrain him, fearing he would become completely exhausted. When Mark says, For they said, he is beside himself. His words did not mean as much as they imply. They suggest an acute apprehension that his mind and body would be unable to stand much more strain. Their concern was a tribute to their regard for him, but it also showed a lack of understanding of the dynamic and all-pervading purpose of their Lord and of the unfailing source from which his strength was renewed. Shortly after the healing of the centurion's servant, Jesus left Capernaum to begin another circuit of the surrounding towns and villages. Accompanied by the twelve and followed by many people, he went southwestwards over the Galilean hills towards the plain of Esdralon. It was springtime, the fresh green of the awakening countryside would bring happiness and a sense of well-being to many of the peoples they followed. The disciples too would probably feel a new sense of eagerness as they left the familiar streets of their own city to begin their first campaign as the twelve whom the Master had chosen to be his apostles. It would be evening before they had covered the twenty-five miles which brought them within sight of the town of Nain. It soon became apparent that there was no little stir in the place, 
a crowd was streaming out of the city gate, and the echoes that came faintly up to them lingering among the hills proclaimed a time of mourning. A funeral procession was making its way towards the burial ground on the road to Endor. It was not long before the two multitudes met and mingled, the crowds who followed the Prince of Life and those that accompanied the victim of death. It was a great and solemn moment when Jesus reached the bier and looked down at the dead face of the young man. An inevitable moment. He turned to behold the agonised features of the widowed mother, who, heedless of the interruption, continued her bitter wailing. Jesus would see far more than her present anguish. He would see the sad change from wife to widow in the humble home, her love for a son who took his father's place her increasing dependence upon his industry and strength. He would know that nothing now remained but sorrow and poverty and loneliness. Such insight would stir to emotion the most callous man. Looked upon by one who knew the human heart so well, it could not fail to move his spirit and evoke his compassion. Weep not. Words, empty words. What comfort could they give? Could they restore to her the life of the son she had brought to birth, only to mourn at his grave? Could they sweep away the load of grief that bowed her body? Could they remove the years that stretched away before her? Ah, dear, lonely, stricken soul, they can do all these things. The Lord of life is standing at your side. There is authority mingled with the love in his words. Reluctantly she lifted her tear-stained face. Her eyes sought and found the face of Jesus. In a moment she realized the words were no longer words. Before he stepped forward and touched the wicker work that held her son, she knew. Young man, I say unto thee, arise. And in the evening light before the hushed multitudes, the young man sat up and spoke. And Luke records with simple significance, he gave him to his mother. So it was that among the hills of Galilee, overlooking the plain that has been, and is yet to be, so typical of man's conflict and death, the apostles learned the highest ministry of their Lord. Multitudes would continue to stream forth from the city gate, bearing their dead, but the Redeemer had come to say to those that mourned, Weep not, and to follow his words of love with power so great that death itself could not prevail against it. A wave of awe swept the people. God was glorified. His prophet was acknowledged and his fame spread abroad. The great tragedy is that the beneficent effect faded with the passing years, and the Lord of life was to take a lonely road to his garden grave. The tragedy continues despite the final triumph of the empty tomb. The multitudes pass by unheeding, or pause to watch and wonder and forget. Only the disciples remain. But to them he gives power to become the sons of God. Though death may step in to rob them of their promise now, he who is alive forevermore and has the keys of the grave and of death will one day stand at the graveside to crown their mortal strivings with eternal blessings.